کرد Okay, I was just waiting. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, Arya Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Raja Griha, together with the great community of monks and the great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Vadakateshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Vadakateshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Valakateshvara said this to the Venerable Shadadvati Putra. Shadiputra, any son of the lineage or a daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristics, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and no also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. The perfection of... Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, tayata, gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhi, soha. Tayata gate gate paragate parasangate buddhi soha. 
Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Valakiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharadvati Putra, the Mahasattva Aryavadukiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Ashurdas, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised. That spoken by the Bhagavan. Apologies for the typos. I actually corrected them, but opened the wrong copy. To fulfill the needs of all beings at their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser and greater common and extraordinary approaches. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Good to see. Very good. So uh, can we, is there enough uh, volume on the, uh, microphone. Okay. Yes. Good. Yes. Thank you. So uh, after tonight, we might be moving on to uh, another text. So I want to try to summarize some essential points about the uh, Mahayana Tara Tantra Shastra. <clears throat> but uh, just because I'm moving on in a um, format way doesn't mean then you shouldn't be picking up the Shastra and uh, reading it um, and uh, reminding ourselves uh, of the truth and the content. So uh, the study uh, traditionally is meant to be cumulative. So it's not like, well, now we're all done with that, so we don't look at it again. Um, that's the kind of style from college or grad school. What we've done with that, we covered that. Well, this is meant to be cumulative, so the idea is that you've been introduced to it, gotten a commentary, read it, and now you, you keep on sifting through it. Um, so uh, in your spare time, <laughs> so you can still uh, look through the Shastra. So fundamentally, uh, it is about Buddha nature, uh, so that's why it's given that title, Buddha Nature of, of the book, with the translation, uh, and with the commentary by Jungle Control and uh, Rinpoche and Kepo Sochi Rinpoche. The commentary is, uh, and uh, two commentaries are given from what's called the Shentong approach, uh, which is uh, meaning basically, literally, uh, other emptiness means uh, uh, a description of uh, Buddha nature in this case, or phenomena as empty of everything they're not, but not being empty of themselves. Uh, this is contrasted with the Rantong approach, which is sometimes called uh, self-empty, um, empty of its own essence. These were terms that uh, came up in Tibet. These were not terms that uh, were used in India. Uh, but when Tibetans went uh, through the texts and uh, were trying to decide what they mean and masters were meditating them and coming up with different realizations, uh, the Tibetans uh, had this classification. <clears throat> the uh, Rantang approach is generally uh, uh, associated with Prasangikya uh, Madhyamika, but not exclusively. And uh, it's the approach that uh, the Gaelic school has spent the most time elucidating. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to maybe simplify it, hopefully not too simple, but uh, I call the Rantang approach, um, there's nothing wrong with you. So uh, generally Rantang approach is uh, a non-affirming negative um, that feels, you know, non-affirming negative means uh, that uh, we're not implying something else. We're just saying um, this, 
just no Atman. When we say there's nothing wrong with you, uh, it does sound like um, that means there is something right with you. <laughs> so maybe it sounds like an referring negative, but uh, I really mean it just in a way like most people think they're flawed or broken, um, damaged, unrepairable, and have to be reminded that actually you're not, or um, there's nothing wrong. I found in teaching and practice that um, most of the time uh, that's not enough for people uh, because their felt sense is there is something wrong and then it feels uh, somewhat uh, patronizing or unhelpful uh, sometimes when we're told, well, actually, there's, there's nothing really wrong with you. Um, it's all in your imagination. Is what we're heard, right? But of course, in um, Yogachar and Shirmatra, um, we do say it's all in your imagination. There's nothing wrong. Um, the uh, uh, discursive thoughts that are based on dualistic um, uh, mind procedures are adventitious and untrue. They're totally imaginary, harikalpika. <sighs> I find it very uh, liberating at certain points in our practice in life to hear that. There's, we don't have to say anything extra about what to do with our lives. In a way, it's just saying, um, there's no restriction. Go out and live your life. Uh, be free to love and be loved. So why do we have to uh, elucidate all the qualities? That's kind of a runtime approach, like just don't make anything up where there's no need to make anything up. Don't uh, solidify anything that needs to be solidified. Um, don't add anything extra. So uh, it has a little bit of uh, what in Western philosophy you call Occam's razor, like don't say anything more than necessary. Let people uh, remove the delusion and uh, then the rest of it, uh, they can just experience. So uh, I take that kind of what um, paradoxically might be uh, called a positive approach to um, saying uh, uh, it's empty. But in the West, when you say it's empty, uh, I hate to say it, but you know, it still feels kind of like a drag, right? Um, because we don't use uh, the word empty in any other way, <laughs> but generally, but... Um, not good, you know, your gas tank's empty. Um, <laughs> that person's empty inside. Um, I don't know, you know, this could be a discussion if we have some time, like, can people think of uh, some positive ways uh, to say uh, or use the word empty in, in regular conversational English or philosophy for that matter. <clears throat> so uh, if there's one word that I wish would be kind of untranslated, uh, uh, just as dharma is untranslated and uh, karma, bodhisattva, tons of Sanskrit words um, are in the dictionary, nirvana. Why can't we just say shunita? Why do we have to like, you know, come up with the void or empty or something like that? Say everything shunita. You go, God, that sounds good. Doesn't that sound good? Sounds even fun to say it, shunyata, and go, yes. So um, when uh, scholars and practitioners and yogis and mahasiddhas and the um, uh, Gilak tradition um, uh, take the round tongue approach, they don't feel they're being dry or scholastic or um, negative. Um, they just feel like, just saying like, um, uh, don't turn down that road, just keep going. I mean, if you're asking for directions and you kind of are a little bit lost and somebody just says, um, no, you're doing fine, just keep going. Just don't make a wrong turn, you'll get there. Isn't that relieving? I mean, isn't it just kind of nice to like, do you have to hear a whole description of path? So uh, for a lot of people uh, saying uh, every phenomenon is characteristic 
characterized by emptiness or emptiness is ultimate truth. It sounds really freeing and liberating. Like, hey, it's just free. No problem. But I think in the West, uh, we still feel like, gosh, that's not quite enough to hold on to. That doesn't give me um, a path. That doesn't give me a yoga. That doesn't give me a method to work with. Because inside, I still feel uh, ashamed or broken or guilty or something just feels wrong. So when you're telling me everything's fine, so that's not helpful. I think it is very helpful uh, in later stages of the path um, where uh, our consciousness and meditation have become quite refined uh, and uh, there's uh, just a little inkling of a doubt and uh, we are able to get a pith instruction, which is, uh, you know, really a master to a student, which is there's nothing really wrong with you, you know. Um, there's a, one of my favorite movies, which isn't entirely realistic, by the way, um, of course, is uh, Good Will Hunting, uh, where the climax scene is where uh, Robin Williams is, uh, sorry if you haven't seen the movie, but uh, it's about a, a kid that endured a lot of abuse and is um, a genius math, but otherwise screwed up in their lives and finally gets up with Robin Williams, who uh, you know has, gets him in his feelings and finally says, it wasn't your fault, right? Over and over, it wasn't your fault. Now, uh, if, the, if the character played by, you know, and uh, in the... In the movie had heard that right in the beginning you know what happened to you wasn't your fault um the matt damon character would have just gone well f you you know what do you know about my life right he wouldn't have been able to take that in but because uh, uh the therapist played by robin had softened him up and got to know him um those words were taken in right you know so that was a negative it's not your fault right it's not your fault it's not your fault um didn't have to say you're a really good person and you have so many wonderful qualities and you'll find a lot of love in your life and you can save many beings and you can do all this. Just what got to him was it's not your fault. And it's not your fault. And he had to say it enough to kind of break through. So there is uh, you know, something really important to uh, that kind of style where uh, there's nothing there. I, I didn't find any. Atman, I didn't find any problem. I didn't find any mistake. And not say anything more than that. Just get it so you're just going right after that um, that kink in our garden hose, as they call it. However, um, I believe that because the Buddhism teachers have been enormously uh, compassionate, they know that uh, they have to also uh, provide uh, what what is there, right? So uh, we do have to say sometimes, uh, your basic goodness can't be destroyed. That was Trungpa Rinpoche's translation of Buddha nature. Uh, and I think that's still good. Your basic goodness can't be destroyed. So it's going to the permanence of Buddha nature and to uh, this quality uh, that we're worthy, uh, we have things to offer, we're not bad people. So uh, I still kind of like that translation it's just a summation of Buddha nature, our basic goodness. The Shastra, of course, goes over uh, seven Vajra points, um, trying to show us and convince us. So finally, we can uh, maybe ourselves break down in tears and realize uh, there's nothing wrong with us. And we have lots of uh, opportunities and goodness and Buddha qualities to manifest. So I myself, uh, like uh, from a practice point of view, uh, sometimes use uh, a Rantang approach uh, and sometimes a Shentang approach. Uh, since my own teachers were doing this, I feel justified <laughs> doing it. Uh, but of course, when we're uh, talking philosophy and talking logic, um, you always, in a sense, um, end up, uh, you know, kind of biased towards one side or another, right? So um, I'm curious, will 
uh, maybe take some kind of a, a poll in a few minutes, like, would you rather hear, like, there's nothing wrong with you and no worries? Or do you want to hear all the good qualities um, like that? <clears throat> My uh, experience is many times, particularly in American Dharma, uh, we can hear a lot of positive quality um, teachings. We can do a lot of meditation, be doing, doing a lot of um, a tantra or even Dzogchen and Mahamudra, but uh, deep down, um, people still feel that uh, there's something wrong with them. I'm very nosy and uh, I have good investigative therapy skills and I met with many teachers, you know, um, Western and, uh, you know, Tibetan and Indian and Mongolian. And um, I'm really interested that uh, sometimes when I talk to people personally um, and kind of uh, get inside their head, like this really, a, a still after all the Dharma practice, after being teachers, there's still this uh, internal self-loathing, you know? There's still these fundamental doubts about our worth and still a fundamental confusion. It's covered um, by really wonderful teachings and also uh, genuine uh, realizations too. Um, but it's just like, um, there's a phrase in Tibetan, which is uh, this, a rock can be at the bottom of the ocean surrounded by water, in other words, surrounded by Dharma for millennia, but when uh, you break it open, it's dry inside. So uh, I'm, it's just surrounded by goodness, so you think it would seep in, but uh, there is something that has to be uh, acknowledged that uh, broken and healed before we really overcome so uh, this is a big discussion among teachers, big baffling. It's like, why do sometimes people do so much practice and there's not um, you know, uh, a real turnaround? Uh, you know, why there's not a real breakthrough? Or why do teachers and the students uh, seem to do a lot of practice and uh, be doing well and then um, get themselves in trouble or become discouraged later, right? So uh, uh, I ask these kind of uh, questions to teachers and long-time practitioners. Uh, do you, what, how do you get this, you know, what happens when you get discouraged? How do you deal with a loss and discouragement? Uh, it's one of my shit detector questions because people say, oh, I, I never, <laughs> I never get bummed out. It's always like, you know, uh, pizzas and cream then, uh, they're probably lying. <laughs> but I can testify that even though uh, sometimes in my life or teaching or therapy career, there's uh, some disappointments, I never, I don't get disappointed. So I, I feel uh, as fresh today uh, as I ever have been. So uh, it doesn't feel like there's any problems at all that are insurmountable if they're real problems. They're not real problems, they're delusions. So you don't get over delusions. <laughs> you don't like fix a delusion. You just realize I don't have to fix a delusion because it's a delusion, you know, like that. So uh, I'm always happy for people to say, oh, well, how's, how are you doing with all your samsara things? And how's your mood? Uh, and uh, generally, People are sometimes uh, distrustful, like, Lama, you can't still see, like, basically, uh, things are very open and spacious and free with all this shit happening. And I go, well, I do. But uh, I have no wish to uh, accentuate any samsaric. I don't, I still want comfortable bed and pillow, like everybody, right? <laughs> but, uh, we have to, I'm using and talking much about Buddha nature and the Sashta so that we get the courage uh, to examine very closely, uh, are there still parts of us 
uh, that are in the shadow that we don't want to acknowledge, which goes with our goodness too. Are there, uh, are we using Dharma to uh, cover up uh, places we're ashamed of? Are we using uh, Dharma to, um, you know, avoid uh, painful or traumatic things? Um, Chung uh, you know, coined the word spiritual materialism, which um, sounds like, oh God, that's the last thing I want. It'd be like saying, I want to be a codependent or something. So, <laughs> but spiritual materialism doesn't mean you, uh, he's not trashing so much um, or calling out people that become uh, spiritually um, arrogant, right? Um, but uh, he's talking about people that uh, uh, would make him sad that they've done a lot of Dharma practice and, and still they're not um, realizing their own Buddha nature, their own goodness. This is what teachers worry about. We're not sitting around worrying about the egomaniacs, right? That's not, that's a waste of time. So, but um, it's most painful when people aren't um, in touch with their goodness and, um, you know, are, are struggling like that. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> The, um, the Tara Tantra Shastra, as I said, in a scholarly way, sometimes is um, taken from a Shantung approach, sometimes from a Rantung approach. Uh, sometimes it is seen as a, a definitive um, or ultimate teaching, and sometimes it is seen as provisional. So um, in Darshan, uh, I'd like to talk to people and say, what do you think? Is it provisional in other words is it not totally the truth is it kind of like a skillful means to help you along your way and encourage you or is this the way things really are so um that those are important points of discussion uh, whatever approach people use it's very interesting that um and all the teachers i've studied with um uh, they're enormously positive. <laughs> so uh, that's why I'm thinking, well, maybe we need, maybe empty is good because then you kind of say, okay, well, I'm just going to let go of everything. But our problem, particularly when studying Madhyamaka, is uh, to uh, come up uh, very close to a nihilistic position. Do you agree? So uh, it's important just to remind those people that have read um, the uh, Malamadamika Karakas and Red Chana, uh, Chandra Kirti, uh, that, uh, technically and Prasangika Madamika were just, uh, refuting something that would have its own essence. So that's it. We're just going through every category and going, nope, that's, that's not an ultimate. That's not an ultimate. So, uh, you know, everything, uh, is, uh, looks like this, it ends up being somewhat conventional with its own emptiness, doesn't it? So um, in a sense, uh, it leaves everything as it is. Would you be okay with that? Would you be okay to say, um, it's just perfect as it is? So uh, I wonder, you know, um, so in getting ready for the retreat this Saturday, um, I'm enjoying uh, reading um, Tai Si Tupa's uh, commentary on the third Kamapa's uh, um, Mahamudra aspiration prayer. So um, Tai Si Tupa is, I, I don't think travels to the West much anymore. Uh, one of the Kargi regions, so-called. Uh, it's very readable. So I'll bring that with me, but um, it's wonderful where he says, well, here it is. What's the definition of Mahamudra? Everything's perfect. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have to check our mind. So when a teacher says, or even when you read, everything is perfect, do we go, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> They're wrong. It's not. You know, or how do we see that? So, of course, um, 
not everybody uh, realizes Mahamudra right away. Um, so we could say, uh, well, in a sense, they're not perfect. But um, we have to say that in a special way because uh, from Buddhist point of view, uh, the Buddha sees uh, suffering but doesn't see that anybody is damaged or not perfect. It's quite radical, don't you think? <clears throat> so uh, same way uh, Dzogchen uh, comes at it a slightly different way that we call it uh, a great perfection sometimes or great completeness. That sounds kind of new agey to say everything's perfect, isn't it? But uh, when we entertain that idea, um, it also can become a path and a skillful means to notice how easily uh, we make judgments and do condemning and divide things into self and other and solidify and fixate our world, isn't it? But uh, for those of you that can make it to the retreat, we'll, we'll explore these questions. The other reason I wanted people to read the, um, the Tantra Shastra, Tiranya Julama, is um, it uh, generally becomes, uh, in uh, most of the schools, a uh, foundation for doing Tantra. So I don't know how we can have divine pride, Vajra confidence, um, Vajra pride, uh, you know, without doing uh, the kind of transitional work in the Shastra or by studying the Shastra. Because you can't go from, uh, you know, I, I'm a miserable piece of shit to now I'm Chenrezig. Okay? And the Americans try to do that. They just go, okay, now I've got to have um, this uh, Vajra confidence, divine pride, and I'll put my awareness on uh, the Yadam, on the Didi, um, but uh, there hasn't been any softening, there hasn't been any acquaintance with the Buddha qualities. So it doesn't it sound like just kind of, you know, like dress up and, okay, now you're Napoleon. I mean, it just, I don't think it works, right? Um, uh, so <clears throat> that's um, one of the uh, reasons that uh, my old teachers suggested I go and um, become a therapist because he said most people in the West are not ready to do uh, Tantra, uh, let alone Mahamudra and Dzogchen. We need to find uh, that they're good people first and work out their emotional problems. So of course he was thinking uh, from the standpoint of Lam Rim, right? But also thinking from the standpoint of the Uttar Tantra Shastra. So, uh, becoming thoroughly um, uh, invested in uh, the Buddha nature uh, Tathagata Garbha world is generally seen as a basis for uh, authentically doing Tantra. Because uh, uh, when we visualize ourselves, imagine ourselves, have the impairments and so forth, um, we're really kind of seriously um, identifying with this divine nature. So um, at this point uh, in Tantra, um, I wouldn't call it um, humanistic uh, Buddhism anymore, right? I wouldn't call it humanistic or psychological, actually, even. So this way, uh, as much as I like uh, Although I've never met him, I, I've enjoyed reading Rob Priest's books, you know. Maybe some of you are familiar with Rob Priest, you know, kind of psychological data of Tantra. Um, I'm somewhat suspicious of that, you know, <laughs> because I think uh, once once we actually do Tantra, we're leaving the uh, uh, psychological world, um, uh, the, you know, the Western psyche and... Uh, we're definitely uh, leaving the psychological world when um, we're starting to uh, say, I'm putting my identity on being um, this uh, four-armed or 24-armed or uh, Buddha Deva, don't you think? Can you really call that psychology? I don't think so, you know. We can psychologize it, but uh, 
it's a um, paradigm leap from a humanistic point of view. We're not leaving the humanist point of view, just like uh, we're not we're not leaving our regular science, but it's a different paradigm. So the uh, Uttara Tantra Shastra um, uh, for many practitioners and uh, the Tathagata Garbha Sutras are uh, essential to uh, be the um, diving board, so to speak, right? That you have the foundation. So when we start talking about um, clear light mind or um, alpha purity um, or uh, you know, thus the natural state of the mind, we're not identifying that with a psychological state or um, a uh, confused self, right? That's hard. So that's why um, we have this extraordinary uh, Tantra vehicle, um, Maha Yoga vehicle. The Tara Tantra Shastra is essential for that. For that. <clears throat> So I uh, don't think I need to say a lot more, um, except for those people that are uh, doing the um, Buddha Dharma program. Um, we will we're on to we will we'll have an essay questions, but we'll be on to another book called A Study of Swatantrika. So. Um, <clears throat> Should I say a little bit about that real quick? <laughs> it's like, okay, so um, <clears throat> Prasangika means uh, consequence goal. So uh, Prasangikas say they don't have a um, Mindy Malkins. We don't have a uh, position of our own. We just want to show you how you're, if you hold on to any position, uh, we'll f show you you're absurd. <laughs> It's really delightful to be able to do that. Um, but um, the Swatantrika, Swatantrika means um, uh, establishment, uh, you know, you independently established. So you can say, well, actually, don't we have to really establish something? I mean, maybe we're establishing at least our methodology. We're believing in our methodology and so forth. So uh, the reason we're studying this text is because um, uh, historically, it's important uh, to understand the school uh, because when um, uh, Buddhism really uh, was, took root in um, Tibet, then uh, the uh, Guru Rinpoche uh, came uh, at the request of Chantarakshita and um, uh, the king. And um, Santarakshita was the last really kind of great philosopher, practitioner, yogi coming from India. And his style sometimes characterizes Yogacara, Svatantrika, <laughs> Madhimikan. So, but uh, it's a very sophisticated system of um, uh, working with the Madhimikan and uh, emptiness doctrine while at the same time uh, affirming uh, valid experiences. So uh, for people that are doing the Buddha program, you can tell that we're not just doing scholarship, we're doing um, understandings that uh, uh, support um, and uh, inform our meditative experience. Uh, we found that to be the case. And that uh, the teachings um, are connected with uh, actual people and uh, actual teachings, right? They're not disembodied like that. And then we're doing, you know, a thought, authentic practice lineage uh, uh, scholarship. Isn't that nice to know? <laughs> so uh, it's 740 and uh, I'm willing to have a few uh, comments about uh, our complaints if someone would like to speak up. <clears throat> Hi, Wangla. Um, it's Ashley. Um, I was wondering, like, how do we know if we're in touch with, like, our basic Um I know it's more than, like, psychological, but 
It's probably too simple of a question to ask. No, it's a really good question. So, <clears throat> uh, when when we're reading, uh, something in the reading makes sense, and then uh, we're inspired to go further. So, uh, our Buddha nature wants to go further. It's not static. So, uh, we we want to know more, right? And we want to. Uh, uh, rescue people or teach, you know, so people overcome their suffering. So, of course, you know, bodhicitta is one of the main uh, aspects or powers of Buddha nature, right? We, we just can't stand to see people suffer. So we want to become awake in order to be the best, uh, best helpers for them, right? Um, uh, one big way, though, is... is um, as infuriating as uh, people are, um, people just start looking, you know, kind of more intelligent and, and good in a very fundamental way. You know, we, we start finding ourselves more patient with others. And, and so even if things aren't going our way, and even if they're acting kind of nutty, we, there's still uh, a sense of workability and, and goodness going on. So, uh, the the best indicator is that uh, we we really want to be of benefit to others, uh, and uh, we really want to be not harming ourselves. So, you know, when uh, that's part of Buddha nature and Bodhicitta is not harming, right? We don't just think not harming others, but so we don't feel like doing self-destructive drugs or self-destructive activities, you know, or self-hating, you know, so we go, well, it's really weird. I haven't, like, really, you know, been doing my self-loathing this month, you know, so, <laughs> so things, things seem more workable, actually, and it, it's important um, to, you know, actually meet with one's teacher and talk in darshan so we get uh, genuine feedback like that. That makes sense, right? I don't know. Are you still there, Ashley? Yeah, yeah it makes sense. Thank you, Lama. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. I think it's hard. You, you, ha James has to hear. He needs to say hello. Yeah. Hi, Lamala. Thank you for this teaching, as always. Um, I'd like to piggyback on Ashley's question and the comment that you brought up earlier, which is more helpful: a non-affirming negative or some sort of positive qualities when looking at self-loathing. In the work that I do, I run across a lot of people. And the friendships I make and the acquaintances I make, I run across a lot of people that have some moment in time that they hold on to that defines for them qualities where they're not enough. And of course, you know, in therapy, we deal with that in a lot of different ways to really get at those things. And some people deal with that through distractions of drugs, alcohol, materialism, whatever. But it does seem like there needs to be both sides of that to really break that open for people, depending on how they're approaching it. Because some days it sounds yeah, I, yeah. good. Some days it sounds really nice to hear there's nothing wrong with you. Other days it sounds really nice to hear what's right with you. Yeah, that's right. I think they need to alternate, you know? So it's kind of like walking. You know, uh, or I like actually the uh, uh, metaphor of cornering people. So you kind of create this funnel and you, you corner them like that. <laughs> so that uh, we, th there's no wiggle room either way. Like that, yeah. So but I, I think sometimes alternating them and um, 
of course, tantric way is sometimes uh, to alternate and uh, keep people off balance, uh, which means keeping them off fixation. So uh, the lamas are always, you know, we're just stiff, like, um, so sometimes you have to kind of push this side uh, or push that side. So uh, working with students is um, like getting a big refrigerator out of an old house where it's wedged into that place in the kitchen and doesn't have any wheels. So you have to kind of, you know, so, you know, you know, like why you, you did that last week, why are you doing this week? And, you know, you, you're not being consistent, Lamla, but if we're, if teachers are totally consistent, then, uh, you know, and just in that technique way, of course we're consistent from bodhicitta, but then uh, people's uh, ego gets, gets onto it, right? So you, you have to do this with a big refrigerator, you know, to get it out of its little niche there, like that. So I agree, we need to do both sides. And all the teachers I've studied with um, uh, are going to do the via negativa and the via positiva both together. <clears throat> so it's very, so Tibetan, you know, it's like one day, but um, so it's also a way of getting fixated. So one day the teacher said, you're really doing a good job. I'm just so grateful. And then the next day they're going, you fucked up again. I can't believe it. Um, so uh, this is actually really good training for real life. So we don't really uh, <laughs> totally, uh, we, we stay, whether we're praised or blamed or negative or positive, uh, we go the middle way like that. Ideas to see nature of mind, ultimate nature of mind, uh, it's not biased, right, towards negative or positive, right? Not biased to samsara or nirvana. So completely unbiased, you know. So as I've said a number of times, uh, it's difficult to take a sailboat, small sailboat, and sail straight into the wind, right? Can't do it. So you have to tack. So generally, it's it's until we're very close to port, um, you you have to tack a little bit. But when you get near the dock, you do have to sail straight for the dock, right? So um, when somebody um, is at that level of training and practice, uh, then uh, the teachings are very just concrete and completely uh, seems completely ordinary, um, but they're most profound because uh, you you've climbed the mountain and you've done the tacking back and forth, and now you're just kind of uh, going right into the slip with um, you know your sailboat. So it's completely unbiased. This absolutely it's so ordinary that we miss it. The famous Dzogchen thing like what it's so it's so close we don't see it. It's so ordinary we don't take it seriously. It's so deep we can't fathom it. You know, it's present so we can't attain it anew. You know, you're home, right? You're home like that. That's Dzogchen so nice because there's a feeling of home is really important. We're not biased like that. But of course, in the relative world, even when we're home, sometimes um, our partners think we're great and sometimes we're not so great. <laughs> so the all ground, you know, uh, that's what's interesting about, you know, maybe we'll have a chance to go a little bit into that. Uh, so uh, particularly in Dzogchen, Lanchen Nintik, um, Digme Lingpa's teachings, you know, uh, how the primordial ground uh, manifests uh, both sanity and uh, duality, you know? It's very interesting. It sounds like, wow, I, you know, I feel like you want to have a dialogue with a primordial ground, like, did you really have to, like, forget to notice yourself? It would have been so much easier. So um, maybe that'll be a poem by Morris, you know? So, you know, it's kind of like Tevye, like, could you just pick someone else, you know, and fiddle her in the groove, you know? Um, but nevertheless, um, many realized teachers have pointed out that uh, the confusion and liberation come from the same source, right? It can't come from anywhere else. And uh, 
you know, I'll be going over Gal Dorje's uh, three points with Patram Shea's commentary. So it's wonderful when we gain that certainty, not just through analysis and, um, and inference, but through direct experience that it can't be anywhere else, it can't be any other thing. And that's nice, right? Just very plain, right? You just go, well, can't be anything else. You know, there's no need to speculate further in your home. So we'll go into that, you know, uh, uh, at the retreat time, even though we have a short period, uh, we'll try to make the most of it. Mm. So one last question and then, uh, or comment. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see everybody. Like, no. Well, I guess I'll chime in out of... <laughs> okay, good. Uh, well, I don't really have anything, any ax to grind here, but uh, I know that when I, uh, now, if I think of leaving the path, or whatever you want to call it, it's like that. It's like, where am I going to go? <clears throat> there's, there's nowhere to go. It's like being trapped almost. It's like being a snake inside of the, the, the metaphor of the snake inside of the hollow bamboo. Yeah. So there's not, there's really not, it's not a question of like, oh, I figured out that there's some other way. It's just, there's really, I, I have this feeling that there's really just nothing else that I could do. Like I'm, uh, I, I don't want to say stuck, but just kind of don't really have any other choice anymore. <laughs> it's not a... Yeah, so that's a wonderful feeling, you know. So uh, it's like choiceless awareness, you know. Choiceless awareness isn't just like, okay, we're we're not picking and choosing. It's just we have that realization there's nowhere else to go, you know. So if even if you fall left or you fall right, you're still falling on the earth. Uh, you can't lose. So, uh, you know, mature practitioners have that feeling that um, uh, I don't want to leave, but even if I couldn't, I couldn't leave. You're just going to end up, you, the path is everywhere. So uh, then there's a great confidence that comes, you know. Well, that's nice, yeah. So we don't, when we're doing practice or when we're in samsara, sometimes, of course, it is necessary to feel on the razor's edge. That's a necessary experience, but uh, the razor's edge is uh, quite wide too. <laughs> <laughs> so when Jushri's sword, uh, you know, is very wide like that. Takes, I'm also takes, excited uh, that we're going to study Svatantrika actually. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very sophisticated system. Um, and, uh, uh, I, I do believe that, you know, the um, refinement does make a difference in our experience um, in any kind of expertise or study. Um, uh, like if people are musicians or foodies, um, then uh, their knowledge of the subject and their ability to use parsha and have uh, what Herbert Gunther called appreciative discriminative understanding does enhance the quality of the experience, right? So uh, scholarship is meant to uh, help us taste more and see more and appreciate more. It isn't meant to uh, become more proud or discard things. So um, the Tibetan scholarship field, um, uh, IOC is, um, uh, more like uh, food critics. <laughs> who does the best pasta? Come on, let's see. Let's who, see who makes the best, um, you know, chili or something like that. You know. <laughs> yeah, good. So uh, I hope we all get to meet again soon. Yeah. So. Um, I guess one thing with our Buddha nature too is um, uh, in Vajrayana tradition, uh, you know, all, all my teachers could be very um, uh, cutting at times, uh, of course, which uh, 
more and more I saw as compassionate, but really a good sense of humor, right? So um, my teacher used to say, uh, you people have a serious disease <laughs> like that. Uh, so uh, that's, that's important. Um, this, uh, our Buddha nature has a sense of humor, right? It's like that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's close up now. This has been nice to have people visit. Yeah. So do closing prayers. Thank you for tonight. Yeah, ciao. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bama. I hope this is uh, showing. <laughs> Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinrezi, Tenzin Jatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lotsang, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions for the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you, Lomala. That was fun. Thank you for staying up so late. Appreciate it. Well, it was yeah. worth it. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. So uh, please uh, hang out in the ultimate sphere uh, like that in your alpha purity. Now I've gotten hung up on that word. Lama Tony's messed me up. I have to use it now. <laughs> well, Keith Dalman's using it now too. Oh, that's good. See, that's how it works. So <laughs> I, I want I want Lama Tony to come up with another word instead of empty. So we'll see. Maybe he already has. So. I think he has tried some, but I'll have to look them up and get them to you. I don't remember. Yeah, I appreciate that. See what happens. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Ciao. Thank Bye. you, Lama. Yeah, Thank you, Lama. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's very good. Thanks, Doug. Is... Bye, Roberta. Bye, Greg. Bye, Roberta. Bye, Lionsar. Bye, Doug. Hey, all right. <laughs> Lollipop. Okay. See you, Morris. Ciao. Thank <laughs> you.